for things that I want more privacy, I'm certainly happy to, to use Monero. So I think that um, there's nothing wrong with someone not wanting to use any particular currency or wanting to use uh, multiple currencies. Uh, and I, I, I absolutely see the utility in only using uh, Monero. Do you love coffee and Monero as much as we do? Consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup. Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans, and if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the Guatemalan farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, Gratuitous, and Monero. This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero and Bitcoin safely on iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source and you always control your own keys. Cake Wallet is trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible for contributions by viewers and listeners like you. And supporting us is easier than ever by typing in MoneroTalk.crypto in the Cake Wallet send address field to send us a tip. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews Mark Falzone a crypto journalist who recently published a very well-made docu-style report on the dark side of Bitcoin in El Salvador. Mark is passionate about spreading crypto adoption and its use case as digital cash, so much so that after the interview, he tweeted that he will be attending our Miami Monerotopia event in April to document Monero thinkers and conversations. We are thrilled to add Mark as our latest media sponsor. Monero Talk starts now. All right, Mark, glad we finally linked up. Nice to meet you, Douglas. So there is there is a bit of delay for anybody that's uh, listening or watching at home. So uh, we'll, we'll try to edit it as best we can, uh, but otherwise bear with us. Um, Mark, so I learned about you, I think it was on Twitter, you had posted a really well done video about the adoption of Bitcoin in El Salvador. You went down there yourself, uh, you walked the streets, and I thought it was really revealing. So I'd love to first talk about that, if you want to get into that a little bit. Is is Bitcoin being used in El Salvador? Uh, what's adoption like down there? So I went down to El Salvador and I spent uh, maybe five weeks or so, maybe a little bit longer to see what was going on. Originally, I went to the Bitcoin Beach, which is sort of the forerunner of Bitcoin becoming the currency in El Salvador. And while I was there, uh, I decided to extend my stay and see the rollout of Bitcoin becoming a national currency of the entire country. So uh, I stayed throughout the rollout. I ended up having to flee the country, as funny and dramatic as that sounds, uh, at the end of my uh, stay there. But I did get to see what the rollout was like and maybe a wider view of it than maybe what was just being posted on Twitter, which was mostly people that were very enthusiastic about crypto, like I am, uh, but maybe let their optimism get ahead of what was actually happening on the ground. Uh, I intend to go back in September, so a year after I left to see, assuming I can get back into the country, to see how things have develop, developed. But uh, while I was there and up until I left, it wasn't really being used as currency. Uh, no merchants down there other than, let's say, Starbucks or McDonald's were actually accepting uh, cryptocurrency or even really aware of it, even though Technically, they were breaking the law by not accepting Bitcoin. What do you mean you had to flee? What, what, what happened with that? So I did a video uh, of my time there. It's a two-hour documentary. Uh, long story short, there was a protest at the very end of my stay in El Salvador. And uh, by that time, I had gotten a lot of media attention in the country. I gained a large following of people in El Salvador. And I was on the national news. and um, I started getting a lot of attention. So in this protest, someone tried to uh, throw a burning ottoman into a, a building to burn it down and burn down the Chivo ATM that was inside of it. And I took it out. 
uh, the person that put it in was one individual, wasn't part of a group. There wasn't swarms of protesters trying to burn this down. It's just this one crazy guy. And when I removed the burning thing from the, the building, the media <laughs> ran up to me and was videoing me. And I realized that uh, in El Salvador, getting involved in politics is illegal. So I realized that me pulling that burning thing out could be construed as me being involved in politics. Um, and I, as soon as I, as soon as, as soon as I saw the videos, I started booking it to the hotel. I said, give me any flight that you, that you can give me to get out of the country. And, uh, I wasn't, I wasn't wrong in doing so because as I was rushing to the airport, one of Bukele, the president of the country, one of his, um, cabinet members shared the video of me with the caption to condemn the protesters showing that, you know, I, I'm a foreigner that's, uh, telling them that they shouldn't be violent. So, um, it, it, it got some attention and, you know, I, I didn't know what would happen if I stuck around to find out. No, oh, wow. That's, that's a little scary. It's crazy. So yeah, what is your overall take then on, on what's going on down there? What is, what, what, what is really happening? Um, give us, give us a little insight into what you think is really kind of happening behind the scenes. Uh, is the, you know, is the president, you know, pushing adoption of Bitcoin because of his, his, you know, uh, ideals, his actual beliefs in, in the project of Bitcoin, or are there other reasons you think he's doing it? Give us a little insight there into what you actually think is, is taking place. That's a, that's a tough question, but I think to understand what his motivation is, it's a good idea to look at the outcome of what's happening in El Salvador and where the Bitcoin is going right now. So if we look at the outcome, what we see is that Nayib Bukele, who's the president there, um, is effectively collecting Bitcoin from the citizens. The citizens don't really want Bitcoin. They don't really understand it. Uh, the businesses don't want it. People come in like Peter McCormick, the big Bitcoin influencer. He spends his Bitcoin there. The businesses accept it like Starbucks, and it gets converted right into USD using public funds, using the $150 million public trust, and it puts the Bitcoin right into Nayib Bukele's wallet. That wallet doesn't have any public oversight. There's no uh, way to confirm if he even has Bitcoin because none of it's public. Uh, and apparently the Bitcoin is not even being kept in the country. It's being kept on uh, exchanges such as Coinbase and BitGo. All the while, Nayib Bukele has even admitted himself that he is using his personal phone to uh, buy, sell, and trade uh, the country's Bitcoin. So if you were to be, I would say, more critical, you would say that what's happening down there is a way to farm Bitcoin from his people and to keep it for his uh, party, his one government party system. Um, if you're more optimistic, you might say, okay, there's some issues with how the funds are being managed. But at the end of the day, people in the country are being exposed to cryptocurrency such as Bitcoin, and they technically have the option of holding it, even though they don't hold the keys. Um, and maybe they'll have better financial outcomes as a result. And, you know, it's kind of up to you to kind of uh, drive, draw the conclusion on that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, great, great, great answer, man. Um, way to kind of describe that all. So where do you see it going? I mean, I, I think me personally, I kind of fall on the side of, well, number one, I don't, I don't think we should be mandating the use of crypto or any currency anywhere. I think it should kind of be the the best technology wins. If people have a real use for this stuff, they'll start to adopt it on their own and use it. Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of a, opposed to the way he went about it. On the other side, I like, you know, that they are introducing people that probably wouldn't get their hands on crypto otherwise to crypto and that it should theoretically uh, evolve into them eventually adopting crypto out of for their own real use cases. Um, do you think we'll start to see that, that they'll actually now start to, the people, the citizens, 
uh, whether it's the the stores and the vendors or the customers actually um, acquire a need for it or they'll, they'll realize an actual real real need and use for it? I think it's inevitable that everyone on the planet will at some point migrate to cryptocurrency. It's, it's a necessary tool um, in the long term. In the short term, uh, first off, I agree with you. I don't think that any currency, whether it's fiat or cryptocurrency, anything should be mandated as currency. People should have the choice as to what they want to accept for payment. I think that's self-evident. With that said, in the short and medium term, uh, there is a positive side. You know, something like I have the stats in my video. I can't recall off the top of my head, but maybe seventy or eighty percent of people in the country don't have access to a bank account, and it's very difficult because they're using the U.S. dollar, which has all kinds of complications they throw on the uh, the banks in in El Salvador. So, for the first time, people are able to have digital money, whether that's fiat or crypto. They're able to buy things online. They're able to save money. When you think about it, you know, keeping your money, physical dollar bills under your mattress with you physically doesn't work as a long-term saving strategy. So there's no doubt that there are positives, but you also have to recognize in the short and medium term as well that Bitcoin has not performed well. And the reason that's re uh, relevant is you have Nayib Bukele, who's trying to sell his citizens on cryptocurrency, forcing them to accept it and to use it, using public funds to uh, fund this experiment, for lack of a better word. And he's, he's telling people it'll work out. And it can leave a really bad taste in your mouth if you know that all of your tax money has gone to this gamble and the gamble seems to be underperforming. Uh, by ten thousand dollars or more, I don't even know how much it's it's down right now. So whether that leaves a, a bitter taste in people's mouth, where they will be suspicious of any cryptocurrency, it might take some more time for them to open up. Uh, but we'll see. Maybe Bitcoin will ten x in the next year, and then people in the country that are critical of it will have a have a different opinion. Do you think it leads to the adoption of, of crypto in general down there? You know, in, in this, in this, let's say we go down the, the positive road, right? So, um, you know, there, there isn't this massive loss of, of money, uh, of tax dollars, uh, you know, Bitcoin price stays stable or continues to go up. Um, people continue to adopt and use, if not because they're being forced to, but whatever it, it happens. Do you think, then people just stick with Bitcoin or it just leads to general crypto adoption down there? Well, I think, I think it would lead to general crypto adoption just because the people down there are going to start using tools. They're going to start using Kraken and Coinbase and BitGo and the ATMs down there like Athena already have other cryptocurrencies on their uh, ATM machines in El Salvador, even before the rollout of bitcoin as a national currency so i think people will see the other cryptos and young people and, and people who are more uh open-minded or, or more curious just in general i guess age really has nothing to do with it they're going to learn and experiment with other cryptos just like i did when i got introduced to crypto pretty late uh two years ago i only knew about bitcoin and then I started discovering other cryptocurrencies, such as Monero. Awesome, man. And do you think we we get to, you know, if things work out down there, that people start using crypto in the way it was meant to be used? You know, kind of peer-to-peer, -peer, hold your own keys. Or do you think that kind of gets lost and because of the way it's initially being adopted, uh, everybody kind of uses it through these third-party services as opposed to using it in the genuine way it's meant to be used. Yeah, that's that's the big question, and it could be the big tragedy that we see with the crypto adoption, which is, you know, we we start using crypto, but it's all through third parties. It's all through our PayPal's and our strikes and our 
you know, all these intermediary accounts instead of wallets. And I personally, I would hate to see that be the case, but you can only hope that people discover things like what's happening right now with the truckers in Canada being, uh, you know, silenced using a third party uh, system, right? So I hope that over time people see the financial censorship. And I think in a place like El Salvador, where you have dissidents being arrested without warrants, people are going to recognize that maybe they don't want to keep their currency uh, held by their one party or one party government. So I hope that people will move towards holding their own keys. Uh, but it's it's yet to be seen because, you know, there is something to be said about the convenience of relying on your government to just take care of you, even though history has shown that's probably not the the, the best way forward. And one, one last question before we move on, I guess, to other topics. Um, you, you mentioned that, you know, there, there was, there were protesters down there. There were people that were kind of opposed to what was going on. How, how big of, of, you know, uh, movement was it? It was it just a few kind of bad apples, or is it kind of within all of the society down there that there is there's this big sector that's kind of reluctant to what's happening? Um, can you give us a little feel there? Like overall, is the population generally okay with it, ignoring it, opposed to it? So when I was down there, I'll tell you a little anecdote. Uh, I was driving through the main city of San Salvador, the, the capital city, and I saw in a building this massive print, this wheat pasted print. And it must have been, you know, 16, 8 by 16 feet, some, some big print. And it was a photo of Naib Bukele in Congress where he brought in all of his armed soldiers to intimidate the opposition to pass a law that he wanted to pass. And I saw that and I thought, wow, that's a pretty strong statement to, to put up on the wall. You know, because one of the things that you hear from President Nayib Bukele is it's the, the 3%. He always talks about the 3%, that 97% of the country supports him. And there's only a, a minority, 3% that don't. And with Bitcoin, it's only 3% that, that don't support him. And in fact, if you look at many of the tweets from the influencers, the Bitcoin influencers of the protests, such as both of the protests that I were at, they would show images of <laughs> 10 to 12 people there and say, there's your 3%. But one of the reasons that I went viral and, and got so much attention there is because I went to the protests and I had a drone and I flew the drone. And when you see <laughs> the number of people that are at the protests, you realize that there's something fishy about that 3% number. Uh, I ended up asking a reporter who became a, a friend of mine, Ricardo, uh, for ElSalvador.com, where that 3% number came from. And it turned out it was from a poll that was done uh, at the very beginning of his um, uh, presidency. And it was an outdated number of just people, not about any specific policy, but the country liking him or not liking him. So when he was elected, people liked him. But any policy, specific policy, they use that same figure, that 3% figure, to minimize the dissent against anyone who has a problem with any particular policy. So um, I can't tell you the number of people that are against uh, the Bitcoin policy. If you ask Naive, he's going to say 3%. But that number is absolutely not true. And again, when you look at the footage that I put out there uh, and really other people too, you can see the numbers are, are substantial. I don't know if it's majority, but there are people with concerns. Yeah, I know th these are obviously very difficult questions. I mean, you went down there, you spent some time. Uh, I can't, you know, but it's not like, you, you know, you've been living down there your whole life. You're, uh, you know, these are just your, right. your perceptions during that time you're down there. Um, but it all all very interesting. So you know, I I, I think uh, I think we'll, we'll move on to another topic, um, and I guess we'll we'll just have to see what happens. So how how did you get into crypto? What kind of what is your crypto story? You mentioned Monero there. I mean, were you were you a, a 
are you a Bitcoin maximalist? Are you a coin agnostic? Kind of tell us your overall kind of crypto story. Hey, cool. I've never heard the term coin agnostic. That's that's <laughs> that's cool. Um, so I got started in cryptocurrency a long time ago. Uh, okay, let me rephrase. For me, it feels like a long time. For anyone in crypto, it's not. It was two years ago. My friend David uh, kept trying to get me to get Bitcoin. He kept trying to get me to you know get into it, and the price was really low for you know whatever whatever uh, whatever he thought the price was supposed to be. And finally, he sent me twenty bucks and said, "Okay, I'll give you twenty bucks. Record a video of yourself trying to get crypto for the first time." So I did. Uh, I recorded myself creating a wallet, doing everything, having no idea what any of it was, showing my public key on my YouTube channel. So everyone watching went in, could get the money as soon as the video went live um, and just having no concept of what any of this was. And uh, after I put that video up, I would get notifications on my phone from time to time that you know, the price was changing. And I thought, okay, this is kind of interesting. And eventually I learned online that people actually live on crypto. Like you can actually use it. It's not just this thing that sits there like a pet rock. So I said, okay, well, I'm going to try to go three days using only cryptocurrency in Philadelphia, which was close to me and see if, if it's possible. And uh, I did. So that's kind of where my interest in crypto currency came from. My channel is, is sort of uh, very beginner focused. And everything that I learn with crypto is learned on camera. So all the opinions that I have, all of the feelings that I feel um, are kind of documented on my channel and my mind can change at any time. You know, it could be tomorrow that I wake up and say, I'm, I hate all crypto and I, I'm, I'm against it. I don't, I, I don't see that happening, but it's a possibility. Um, right now, I, I'm definitely not a Bitcoin maximalist. I don't like the idea of letting ideas control you. Uh, at least if you can help it, you, you, you might not be able to control that. But um, I, I like coins that have use, use cases, things that have utility. So um, my favorite coins right now, I, I hold Bitcoin. I hold um, uh, Monero is one of my favorite coins. I hold Bitcoin Cash. I hold uh, a tiny bit of Doge just because I can buy whistles on e Elon's store. <laughs> uh, which is quite funny, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, in learning more and I, I try to keep an open mind about crypto and uh, NFTs will probably be the next thing that I uh, do videos on learning because I really don't know much about them. Awesome, man. Awesome. So what do you, what do you kind of see as being the invention behind you? Like what, what, what did crypto give us that we didn't already have? What do you kind of see as being like the, the real breakthrough in technology? Like what's, what is the value proposition of crypto in your mind? Well, I'd say there's a few things. I'd say that one of the things that crypto gives us is something we had before to a degree, which is the ability to have privacy of our funds. But when the internet came and as people are using online mediums to exchange uh, value, that fell away and banks have gotten certainly more powerful and uh, they broke the gold standard. So having coins that have uh, supply caps is certainly attractive to me too. So the idea that I can have a currency that I control, that I can choose what I want to do with, that cannot be inflated uh, without my consent. I mean, when I saw what was, ha I'm an American citizen and I saw what was happening over the, the past year with all this printing. And I'm thinking, no, I, I don't agree with this. Don't touch my money. And, uh, you know, of, of course I recognize that I'm in a society and taxes, blah, blah, blah. But um, I don't like the idea that the government or anyone can devalue the money that I have. So crypto for me is a way to uh, take agency of my financial life, just like I would take agency over the health aspect of my life or my religion or my family. So I, I think it's uh, deeply important. 
and that's one of the reasons why I've become so enthusiastic uh, about cryptocurrency over the last year. And how about like the digital cash aspect? So not so much the you know the the sovereign money or you know the the, the non state owned uh, fiat. Uh, but just these aspects that, you know, you can use it freely without censorship, without, um, mm -hmm. tr you know, your transactions being traced. What What's kind of your viewpoint of, of mm -hmm. that uh, use case? Well, the importance of that becomes explicitly clear when you look at people like Kyle Rittenhouse. So a few examples. I mean, regardless of how you feel about Kyle Rittenhouse, I, I don't really care whether you like him or don't. But. When you look at what happened with him, not only were donations sent to him blocked by payment processors, which is, is outrageous, but GoFundMe, the crowdfunding uh, platform blocked it. And then it went a step further where there was a leak of the personal information of the people who made the donations and police officers were fired for supporting a man who was shown in a court of law to be innocent. And if, if that doesn't shock you and show you the, the importance, because a lot of these ideas of privacy and security and having agency over your finances, uh, they're, they're amorphous and they're abstract until it happens to you, until you see a, 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 an example where there's really a, a, a breakdown. Uh, and for me, Kyle Rittenhouse was the first time that I consciously recognized that aspect of it, which is the privacy as aspect of it, that's the point where I said, okay, <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that's pretty, uh, pretty relevant. Do you think, cause I, I think you have a good kind of instinct for, um, adoption and kind of the, the way people are, it's, it's just a sense I get from you. And when I watch your videos, so I, do you think people will start to adopt crypto for that use case? for its, you know, its ability to be censorship resistant um, and private? Do you think people will start to actually use it for that purpose? I think there's a subset of people where privacy is more important to than others. So I think that those people will get involved uh, once they hear about the options that are out there for having privacy of your, your finances. But I think that there's a, uh, another subset, maybe even a larger subset of people, unfortunately, that just have no interest in that. Uh, but what can snag them and what can get their attention is you know, getting away from these big payment processors that are taking four to five percent of their money just to, to, to facilitate something that you can do instantly and nearly free using cryptocurrency. So I think as more people the thing is with crypto is it's both a currency and it's a payment processor. So I think as more people recognize the utility and the use cases of cryptocurrency, uh, I think that it's inevitable, as I said earlier, that people will naturally uh, gravitate towards cryptocurrencies. At least that's that's what I'm betting <laughs> on anyway, with where I'm putting my own uh, my own savings into. Yeah, yeah, same, same here, obviously. Um, so another thing I want to talk about was just your, your, I think Bitcoin cash seems to be one of your, your larger interests. I know you you went to, uh, is it St. Kitts where they're, uh, kind of, there's a, mm -hmm. a Bitcoin cash economy growing over there. Um, I guess tell us a little bit more about that and how you would maybe even compare that to what's going on in El Salvador. Yeah. So uh, long story short, there's a man here named Sonny, and Sonny is part of the Indian community. He's a business owner, and he got interested into uh, he got interested in cryptocurrency. And I noticed that there was all these uh, posts on Reddit of all these places popping up uh, that were starting to accept cryptocurrency, uh, specifically Bitcoin Cash down here in, in St. Kitts and Nevis. Um, so I kind of that that raised some. Uh, flags for me that I, I should go check that out. And I, I did. So I came out and I've been documenting the um, the grassroots rollout of uh, Bitcoin Cash here. Basically, since I've got here in two weeks, they've gotten something like 122 locations that all start accepting it. 
uh, and with a population of 50,000, that's pretty, pretty wild. So um, as far as the differences between El Salvador, I mean, it's black and white. The first thing is absolutely no one here is, is being forced to use it. Uh, if people are taking it if they want to take it. If they take it, some people are converting it into stable coins. Some people are uh, selling it on Coinbase or what, you know, whatever local exchange, and, and some people are holding it. So you know, people here have the choice uh, to use it. So from that aspect, I was saying earlier uh, when I was talking to a friend that this is a lot lower stress for me. It's, it's just fun travel videos, beautiful beaches, um, and no government crushing down on anyone who doesn't want to be a part of it. Now, Roger Ver is, I, I imagine, is pretty involved in that, right? Isn't that even kind of where he's he's living these days? Yeah, so um, Roger Ver lives in St. Kitts. He's a Kittitian. Um, I think he's been in one or two of my recent videos. I had the opportunity to, to meet him and uh, interview him at least briefly. So uh, yeah, Roger's here. Also a friend of mine named David uh, is down here and David is another YouTuber. So um, yeah, it's been, it's been interesting to see a lot of crypto people that are here, which it makes sense uh, that cryptocurrency is spreading here because there are so many people in crypto that are here anyway. Mm. And are they using other cryptos there or it's primarily Bitcoin Cash? So from what I've seen, it's primarily Bitcoin Cash. Okay, so it's 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 Roger Island. So I can I I can't take my Monero down. Yeah, there, you can say yet. that. Well, that's a good question. I'm you know I know uh, from speaking with Roger, he's a huge fan of Monero too. So um, I'm sure he would he would take it, and I would take it too. Another mm -hmm. funny thing, just as a side uh, anecdote, uh, when I was down here, the Nano community, they always want my attention and anyone's attention who's doing marketing or documenting or anything like that. So um, they started tweeting at me and they're like, well, why don't they take nano down there? And it's like, come down. If you want people to take nano here, come down and get people to take nano. So what they did is they picked, they have a tool where if you go to a certain location on a map, then it gives you nano if you claim it and you're at that location. So they picked the point of the highest mountain. That's like a eight hour hike that no one could ever go up. And they're like, Mark, go climb the mountain and get your nano. I'm like, Listen, I can barely walk three or four blocks in New York without getting winded. I'm not climbing a mountain. <laughs> That's pretty cool, though. I like that idea. Um, yeah, it's so interesting. Recently, recently in the Monero uh, subreddit, there was a, a guy who posted, I don't know if you saw this, but he was switching from Bitcoin Cash to Monero and he wrote up, it was actually a very good post uh, for anybody that's interested in Monero because he goes through a lot of, you know, kind of the basics and discusses a lot of things. Um, one of the one of the interesting points that I think he, he made, and, and I agree with it, I'd like to hear where you, where you stand, uh, was basically just with regards to adoption and we kind of talked about this a little bit, but um, this idea that, you know, it shouldn't be forced upon people, obviously, and that it should just happen organically and there should be this real need. And so he talks about how with Monero, he sees that happening on the dark markets. Um, it's not happening so so much yet in the in the clear marketplace with Monero. Um, but it's, it's organically happening on the dark markets out of a real need. And then he sees, you know, the use of it in the clear markets could, could happen at a later date. Um, and he kind of com compares that to Bitcoin cash where he sees, you know, it being adopted in places like St. Kitts, uh, whether or not that's organic or it's kind of, uh, you know, happening because of, you know, Roger Ver and, and the initiatives taking place down there. But he, you know, ultimately doesn't see it as, as being organic and um, is more interested in the organic adoption on the dark markets, even though it may not be like, makes sense to use it in, you know, on the clear, clear markets yet. I'm just curious, do you agree with that? Disagree with that? Uh, just your thoughts on that. 
So I think that someone who's interested in Monero, for example, um, you believe in Monero uh, and you have really good reasons for it. By the way, I do too. I hold Monero and I'm never getting rid of it. It's, it's an important tool. Uh, with that said, you have a podcast we'll where you're, your, uh, we'll throw up your Monero address when we post this video. Maybe, we'll, maybe we'll get some donations. So, sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. That's awesome. Yeah, please. Uh, so in any event, um, you believe in Monero and you want people to learn about it because you, you see the utility of it, you see the, the use case of it. So, uh, for you, you do a, a, a podcast and your hope is that many new people get exposed to your podcast to learn about it and they can uh, make the choice if it's right for them. And that's something I believe in too. That's what I'm doing with my YouTube channel. I hope more people discover cryptocurrency. So I think that with St. Kitts, uh, let's say that uh, we say that Roger Veer is behind all of this, right? He's this mastermind who's, who's showing it. So I guess the, the question I have is, Regardless of who is sending the message, if the message is getting to someone and they see the benefits uh, themselves, that adoption in my eyes is organic. Whether it's coming from a podcast, whether it's coming from an individual uh, who is going door to door, uh, whether it's coming from you know Sonny who's telling his friends to adopt it and they're just doing it because you know Sonny is part of the community and they're trying it and they discover over time whether it's right for them or not. I think that to me, all of that is a is 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 a type of organic adoption what's not organic to me is top down where you have what you have in el salvador which is the government saying you are taking this and if you're not taking it there's there's a consequence there's a punishment so um as far as the uh guy who switched over from uh bitcoin cash to monero i think that's a totally uh reasonable thing to do um, i guess i'm in the camp where I'm okay with having multiple different cryptos for multiple different purchases, uh, purposes. <laughs> One of them is purchasing things. So I, I, I'm super happy to have Bitcoin Cash to make uh, certain, let's say, small purchases or even large um, for things that I want more privacy. I'm certainly happy to, to use Monero. So I think that um, there's nothing wrong with someone not wanting to use any particular currency or wanting to use uh, multiple currencies. Uh, and I, I, I absolutely see the utility in only using uh, Monero. Awesome, man. So what, what, what drives you, man? Uh, you're, you're, you're a talented guy. Um, I like the content you're putting out there. What's uh, kind of driving you in this ecosystem? What, what, what are you most interested in? What are, you, what are you trying to achieve? What's your, what's motivating you with regards to crypto? Oh, cool. Um, for me, I, it started out with curiosity. And for me, it's just this fun thing to tinker with. People seem to like it and use it. So you know, let me dip my toes in and, and see what it's all about and kind of explore it. Uh, that was at the beginning. As time has went on, um, my feelings on crypto have have changed. Um, where now it's th there's more urgency. It's not so much about being curious. It's more about hey, pay attention to this. This is really important. Uh, again, the GoFundMe thing, the Canadian truckers, the Kyle Rittenhouse thing, uh, this financial censorship, all these things that just really infuriate me, uh, make me feel very driven to continue making the kinds of videos that I'm making and for people to discover uh, that there, there is an alternative to it. And I feel like a lot of the content on YouTube about crypto is stuff that I don't care about. It's guys in the rooms showing financial charts. That's great. Trade it, be a stock guy, whatever. But I wanted to make content that is extremely beginner friendly stuff that is something anyone could understand, especially because I'm not an expert. So I'm, I'm just showing what I learned. So uh, in a way, I feel like it's, it's a necessary and lacking type of content uh, on, on YouTube, on the platform of YouTube. And, you know, I tell my mom all the time, like, hey, look what's happening. 
Look at all this government printing. Look at all this inflation. Like, get out of it. Tell your friends, get out of it. There's a way to get out of it. Um, so I, I guess it's more mission driven now than, than maybe it was at the beginning. Are you going to be in Miami for uh, the Bitcoin 2022? I don't have plans of it yet, but that doesn't mean that that will that won't change. But we'll see. Okay. Reason I'm I'm asking because we're throwing a, a Monero conference down there. We'd love to have you, man. Uh, it'd be great if you came down and uh, you know maybe as a media sponsor, you made a video of it, kind of give your impression. Uh, I think you do a really, you do a great job. Uh, you're a journalist. I think, I think you're, you got, is that what you went to school for? Is that where your, where your talent, obviously it's where your talents lie, but is that also where your training lies? So I wouldn't necessarily call myself a journalist, although it does say that on my Twitter bio, cause I'm trying to get the blue check mark. <laughs> I think that'll help me get it. But, um, yeah, I would say a more like a, a, a documentarian if, if anything, but, um, my background is in fine art. So, uh, you know, I studied a little bit of filmmaking in school and, and photography. So um, the, the creative side is, is, and the humanities are definitely appealing to me. But Monero Conference sounds pretty awesome. And that, that is definitely something that uh, I would be super excited to, to come check out and, and document. Awesome, man. I will, I will follow up with you on that. Uh, is there anything else you want, you want to bring up, you want to talk about? Well, I don't know if there's any big topic other than, um, you know, looking at and following what's happening in El Salvador. Uh, it's been, I'll tell you one quick uh, thing before, before we get off here. And that is, uh, I was looking at some of the numbers and trying to understand what the price of Bitcoin would need to be for El Salvador to break even and really how much Bitcoin they even had. And, uh, what I found and the numbers are, I think in a recent bit video of mine called El Salvador, Bitcoin and El Salvador disastrous success. So what I found is that the country uh, purchased uh, at the time that I did the video, 1,400 Bitcoins, uh, but they claim to have given out $30 worth of Bitcoin to all of, uh, I think 3 million of their citizens is the number that Naive, um, quoted uh, or number that he said on his Twitter. But if you do the math, what you find out is that the number of Bitcoins they had at the price that they bought them meant that they were uh, 700 or 600 Bitcoins short. So they gave out something like 2,003 Bitcoins, but they only had 1,400 Bitcoins. So <laughs> when you think about what that means, that's a little bit scary because we're coming from a world where you know, we had dollars tied to gold in a bank and then all of a sudden we have more dollars and there was gold in the bank. And now we saw within, I think it was within one week of El Salvador making a national currency, they were already in a situation where they had given out more Bitcoin than they actually had in their accounts. So uh, yeah, it's pretty interesting. And again, we'll, we'll see how things shape up there and it, it could be very, it could work out very positively. So uh, we'll see. Yeah, once again, I think you 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 did a good job at kind of showing the the other side of the story there, not the the all the the super hype. Uh, it's you know Bitcoin is being adopted in El Salvador. You should kind of show the truth behind it. Um, were you considering or any interest in the you know the, the Canadian truckers? Right, we talked about the GoFundMe thing. Were you were you considering doing any kind of piece with that, like uh, doing any journalism with that? I will be. Um, that is extremely important. There's so much going on down here that it, my, my production schedule is, is shifting, but that will be a, a big focus of mine is, is that uh, issue also with Kyle Rittenhouse uh, for a video that I have already planned on my docket about Monero. So my video on Monero, Monero excuse me, will cover the, the truckers and will cover Kyle Rittenhouse. Oh, amazing, man. Amazing. Uh, please reach out to me if you, if you think we could help in any way. So where can where can people learn more about you, follow you? Um, so right now, the easiest way is just to search me on YouTube. It's just my name, Mark, M-A-R-C, Falzon, F-A-L-Z-O-N. I also have a Twitter account, which is 
same, Mark, M-A-R-C, Falzon, F-A-L-Z-O-N. So I'm happy to uh, talk with any of you guys. I'll also be in the uh, Monero uh, Reddit sub where I'm already a, a subscriber to. So uh, feel free to reach out to me for any reason or just to say hi. Awesome, Mark. Thank you so much, man. I wish we didn't have this delay. I, I, um, I feel like it's slowing us down a little bit, but I, I have a feeling we're going to meet in person and we'll be able to have a, you know more of a heart to heart there. Um, I'll reach out to you after this. Would would really love to try to maybe get you to participate um, and and you know do some journalism down there at the conference. Would be amazing. That sounds uh, wonderful to me. And again, I apologize about the the delay. A life here on the islands. The the internet is not one of the the perks, uh, even though the beaches and the the warmth are. So thank you again. It was great talking with you, man. And I'm really looking forward to meeting you in in person. Awesome, man. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.